Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. If you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. For 13 weeks, we have been walking through Psalm 51, understanding that this is talking about the way back to God. That David has committed an egregious sin. He has committed murder. He's tried to cover things up. And for nine months, he lived in a state where he was not right with God. He tried to cover up cover it up. He tried to do everything he could, but it could not restore his fellowship and his with the Lord. That was until God sent a preacher to put his bony finger in David's face and said, thou art the man. And the one thing about David is that he was a good repenter. That's exactly what made David the man after God's own heart, is that he was a good repenter. That whenever things were pointed out, he was quick to repent to the Lord and try to get right. And Psalm 51 was David's prayer to go back to God. It was him confessing that he did wrong and that he offended God and that he needed God to restore in him a clean spirit, a right heart. And we're thankful for this. And so if you don't mind, as our habit has been, to take Psalm 51 and to read it all the way through, and then we'll stop and pay attention to the verse that we'll be hitting. Day. So one last time, if you don't mind, look with me in Psalm 51, and let's start in verse number 1. Psalm 51 in verse 1, the Bible says this, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions. And my sin is ever <laughs> before me against thee. Thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. That thou mayest, mightest be justified when thou speakest. And be clear when thou judgest. Behold I was shapen in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold thou desirest truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part thou shalt make me know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. That the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are of a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then thou shalt offer bullocks upon... <coughs> thine altar. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, notice in verse number 18 where it talks about uh, um, do good in thy good pleasure. Then notice again in verse 19 it says uh, thou be pleased. And so with this we're going to cover the idea when God is pleased. When God is pleased. And that brings question that sometimes people will bring up in a different kind of way. They'll ask, is it possible, is it really possible to be pleasing to God? Well, the answer is yes, it is possible. You know, a lot of people go by and they have an idea or a vision of God that God is always 
like a mean old man looking forward and criticizing everything that you do. Well, that's wrong and that's wrong and here's a dirty dish here and you didn't do this right. And they live under an idea of an oppression that God is a big old ogre that we can't make happy. I try as much as I can and I can't please him and I do my best and they get to the place where they give up. Well, fine. If he's not going to be happy with what I do, then, then I'm not going to try anything. But yet, nothing can be further than the truth. We can be pleasing to God, and God wants us to be pleased. In fact, David, at the end of this, he says, then thou shall be pleased. He's saying at the end of this, there is something that I could do to please God. Now, we know that David displeased God back in the time of uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11, where it's recording David's sin with Bathsheba and going through the idea of Uriah, it says this very clearly, and this displeased God. It was very clear that the sins that David was doing had displeased God. But now as David is getting right with God, as David is uh, working on restoring his fellowship with God, he says, and then thou shall be pleased. Now, before we kind of start with this idea, let me start, or before we cover the idea, let me start with this principle, God loves you. There is absolutely nothing you can do to make God stop loving you. God cannot love you anymore, and he refuses to love you any less. You have to start off with that principle that we're not talking about trying to get God to love us. God loves you supremely. God loved you so much that he sent his son to die for you. It's not the matter of trying to earn God's love because God loves you regardless, no matter what you do. Now, that's different than pleasing him. For example, we as parents, we love our children no matter what. There may be times that our kids disappoint us, but it doesn't mean I stop loving them. All right? Why didn't you do dishes last night? Well, I'm not happy. I'm not pleased. Doesn't mean that just because they didn't do dishes that I cut them off. They're, I no longer love you. That's it. That was one dish too many. You've crossed the line. You're, I no longer love you. It doesn't work that way. A parent will love their child no matter what. In fact, as I work with parents, parents who are brokenhearted because their kids are so far away, you can see the love that the parent has because they're so brokenhearted. So broken. I love my kids so much and I want them to come back. I love my kids so much that I want them to do best. I love them so much I wish they were back with me. I love my child so much I wish they would call me. I love my child. You could hear that. Even though the child is not right. Even though the child has decided to do their own thing. The love has not stopped. And we have to establish this fact early on that there's something different here about God loving us and us pleasing God. Because there's nothing you can do to make God stop loving you. God cannot love you anymore. He loves you so supremely that he cannot love you more. So it's not the idea that we're trying to get God to love me more. I'm his favorite. No. <laughs> there's nothing you could do to make God love you more. And he refuses to love you less. That fact has to be established. But we can come to the idea that we're dealing with the idea with. Can we be pleasing to God? Can we be pleasing to God? Well, those are good questions. And that's actually something I deal with folks quite often with the idea. Can I please God? Can I make God happy? Can I be right with God? This is an important establishment. And the answer is actually simpler than what you might imagine. And so if you don't mind, hopefully I'm grabbing your attention now. Let's understand this idea of pleasing God. If you don't mind, let's turn to the book of Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. And I may turn this to a sing-along. That means you've got to have participation today, okay? I'll, I, I'm going to teach you. Kind of I'll ask a question and you give me the answer. And we'll do this as a kind of a sing-along to kind of nail this down. Notice if you don't mind in the book of Revelation in chapter 4. The book of Revelation is the last book in the Bible. The book of Revelation and chapter number 4.
So we're going to walk through and put principles together bit by bit by bit. And I want to show you how easy it is to be pleasing to God. So <laughs> notice with me in verse number 11. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11. Notice this. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So we start off by understanding that God created us. We understand, that's a fact. God created us. He created everything. And why did God create us? To please God. And so that's the first part of the sing-along that I want you to go with. Is that I'm going to ask you, why was we created? And your answer is? To please God. So this is the first principle. This is what the Bible says here. That we were created. God made us. And he made us for purpose. He made us for a reason. And that reason was, is to please God. Well, that's pretty simple, right? But that makes a follow-up question. If we were created to please God, we have to come up with an answer. We want to know how to please God. If we were created to please Him, we need to know how. Now, God's not going to say, well, I made you, now you got to figure it out on your own. It makes logical sense that God would tell us what pleases Him. God's very fair, and He establishes clear guidelines. So, why was we created? Good, all right? Some of you are awake. Let's try it again. Why was we created? To please God. To please God. So the next question is, we got to figure out what pleases God. Turn with me, if you don't mind, to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews in chapter number 11. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11 will give us the answer to that next question. Why was we created? To please God. So what pleases God? That is an excellent question. And that is a question that needs to be answered if we're going to be pleasing, with God, pleasing to God. So notice with me, if you don't mind, in the book of Hebrews chapter number 11. The book of Hebrews chapter number 11. And notice with me, if you don't mind, in verse number 6. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Notice this. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Now that's a clear declarative statement. Without faith it is impossible. No way possible to please him. So if we know that without faith it is impossible to please God. What pleases God? Faith. That's what it says here. Without faith it is impossible to please God. So therefore the only way to please God is by faith. Well that makes sense right? Uh, that's what it says here. So. <laughs> God wants us to live by faith. And that's a religious term that is used all over. Have faith, have faith, have faith in God. We'll, we'll define that in just a second. But let's catch up and make sure that we're all on the same page. First of all, why was we created? And what pleases God? Faith. Now we need to define our terms. What in the world are we talking about? What is this idea of faith? Different people will try to define faith different ways. <laughs> uh, how do, you know, what is faith? If we're going to be pleasing God, we need to know exactly what faith is. So we, let's let the Bible define itself. In the book of Hebrews chapter number 11, it describes faith. That over and over, uh, we call this uh, the hall of faith chapter, that it says, by faith, Adam, by faith, Adam. Abraham, by faith, Moses, by faith, Moses' parents. And what you see is that you'll see the, the statement, by faith, then you'll see the person, and then you'll see the action afterwards. And all this is doing is describing faith. So Hebrews chapter 11 describes faith. Hebrews chapter number 12 defines faith. So notice with me in the very next chapter, Hebrews chapter number 11. And notice with me, if you don't mind, as the Bible defines faith. Notice with me in Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. And notice with me, if you don't mind, in verse number 2. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, it says this. Looking unto Jesus, 
the author and finisher of our faith. Notice those three words, first words in verse number two, looking unto Jesus. That is the definition of faith. Remember, faith is not on how much you have. It is the object that you have it in. True faith is in Jesus Christ. Looking unto Jesus. Jesus. That's a good definition for faith, looking unto Jesus. Now, the reason why we say that is because what makes faith matter is the object of our faith, not how much you have. We all know people who have faith in the environment, and their faith in the environment is probably more than we have the faith in Jesus Christ. You know people like that? I mean, their, their entire faith is in there, but is that a faith that's going to save them? Is it a faith that pleases the Lord? No, because it is not how much faith you have. It is the object of your faith. Does that make sense? In Numbers, it gives a story. Uh, the people had murmured and complained and God had enough and he sent vipers to bite them. Now people are poisoned. Some of them are blind. And so God told Moses to put up a serpent on a staff and he told him this simple thing, to look and live. So what would happen if you had someone who was just freshly bitten and as he's suffering, he looks up with both eyes and he looks upon that staff. What would happen to him? He would live. Because he looked, he lived. What happens with someone who, who has been bit and now one of his eyes are swollen and he's on the ground and he looks up to that staff? What would happen to him? He would live. What would happen to someone who, because of the poison going through him, his, his, both of his eyes are swollen, he can no longer see, but he looks up the best he can to, towards that object? What would happen to him? He would live. So it wasn't the idea of how much sight they had or the matter of how much faith. It was the object of the faith that made the difference. Now, the reason why I could say that is because sometimes people will say, well, you're a pastor. You're supposed to have lots of faith. But it's not how much faith. You could be pleasing to God with just as little faith as you have, the faith of a mustard seed, just by looking unto Jesus. It's not how much faith you have. It is the object of your faith. So faith defined is looking unto Jesus. Now, let's get a running start. First of all, why was we created? And what pleases God? And what is the definition of faith? Looking unto Jesus. Pretty simple so far, right? So, so far we understand we were created to please God. And we know what pleases God, that's faith. So, we want to know what faith is. What is faith? It's looking under Jesus. It's making Jesus the object of our faith. It's who we're trusting. We're depending on Jesus. He's the one I'm looking for the answer. So as a practical sense, I say, all right, I need help with my test at school. And I look up to Jesus. Would that be pleasing to him? Yes, because you're looking up to him. All right, I'm fixing to get in a car accident and I see it and I got just a moment to pray. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Would that be pleasing to him? Yes. A parent saying, I don't know how to raise my kid. God, help me. Is that? Yes, because we're depending on Jesus. He is the object of our faith. Someone who could say, I had this crazy preacher knock on my door and say that there's a place to, uh, way to go to heaven. All right, God, so if there's a way to go to heaven, I don't even know if you exist. But if there's a way to go to heaven and you show me in a way that I understand, I'll believe it. Is that pleasing to God? Yes, it is because he's trusting God. It is the object of the faith. He didn't have a lot of faith, but he's looking up and said, I don't even know if you exist. But if you do, show me. It's the object of the faith. Now, we want to continually be pleasing to God, so we want to increase our faith. So that's the next question. Where do I get faith, right? So get running start. Why was we created? And what pleases God? And what is the definition of faith? Looking unto Jesus. So the next logical question is where do I get faith? Do I just sit here and come on, come on, come on, I need, come on. Is that how I get faith? Well, how do I get faith? 
Well, that's an important question. If I know that faith pleases God, and I was created to please God, I want to do what I was created to do, I want to find out where do I get this faith at? Where do I get faith from? I meant, I can do the best I can. Where does faith come from? Well, that's a good question. I'm glad that the Bible answers that. Look with me in the book of Romans. The book of Romans. Again, this is a simple lesson. But God makes things simple on us on purpose because you know we can't handle complicated things. Romans chapter number 10. So we know that we were created to please God. And through the study of scripture, we understand what pleases God. The Bible says very clearly, without faith, it is impossible to please him. So we understand that faith is what is necessary to please him. We understand that the definition of faith is looking unto Jesus. It is the object of our faith that matters. What are we trusting in? And that... (laughs) We know that faith can be at varying degrees, but it doesn't matter the varying degrees. It can be trusting God. As we're turning to Romans chapter number 10, may I encourage you that some people think, well, I can't be pleasing to God. I don't have the faith of pastor. It doesn't matter how much faith it is the object of your faith. A brand new Christian can look up to Jesus and they trust Jesus for what they know and they could be pleasing to God. They could be, you could be just as pleasing to God as I am Just by looking under Jesus. Which brings us the question, where do I get faith from? How do I get it? Is it something I work up? Is it something that I quench, uh, tighten my whole body and say, come on, come on, faith. Where do I, come on. Where do we get faith from? Well, the book of Romans chapter number 10 gives us the answer. Romans chapter 10, and notice with me in verse number 17. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, it says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, hearing is the vehicle, so let's just uh, move that so we get a direct line. Faith comes by where? Word of God. Good. Faith cometh by hearing. The hearing's the vehicle, but we get to the other end, which is the word of God. So faith comes by? The word by the word of God. Comes by the word of God. So what does this mean? Well, did you know that the Bible is full of promises? It's full of promises. And those promises work as an if-then statement. That's computer language, meaning that if you do this, then this will be a result. An if-then statement, okay? So we meet our condition and God will do his part. There's plenty of them. For example, the most famous Bible promise in all the world is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That if anyone believeth in him, he should not perish but have everlasting life. So the if then statement. What is the requirement of the person who is going to have faith? They are to believe in him, right? And as a result, they shall never perish but instead they have. Okay, so that's an if then statement. Our part is to believe or trust Jesus. As a result of that, we now have, will not perish, but we now have everlasting life. That's a simple promise. Isn't that simple? Our thing was to look up to Jesus, and as a result, that we shall never perish, but have everlasting life. Now, of course, we define and describe that idea of believing is that it's not just an intellectual thing, but it is an idea that it is a belief that I put my trust in. For example, I'm sitting down here on this pew. When I sat down on it, I showed faith that this was going to hold up my weight. Now, I may have been worried for a second there, but it ended up holding my weight. All right? Let's say that you have an airplane ride. All right? I can go up to the plane and I can say, can I see your service log? Is this full of gas? Have the pilots been drinking? All right? I could go and do a full thing and I could be convinced that the plane is going to carry me from here to wherever I'm going. But it does me no good until I get on the plane. And so it's not an idea of just intellectual belief. It is a belief that produces an action. I am trusting in it. And the proof that I'm trusting in is I'm sitting on the plane. Does that make sense? And so this is the idea here. Because I believed in God and I believed him so much that I put my trust in him. Because I put my trust in him. I shall never perish, but have everlasting life. 
a simple promise that even children can understand. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. An if then statement. The Bible's full of promises. And so all that you have to do to be pleasing to God is to take God at his word and then God comes through. And what happens, you begin to trust him some more. Let me give you another example from a, uh, a more of a human side. Let's say that I, <laughs> I make an appointment to show up at your house at 6 o'clock on Monday night. And then at 6 o'clock on Monday night, I show up. And you go, okay, he showed up on time. The next time I make an appointment and I say, I'm going to show up at Saturday at 945. And I show up at 945 on Saturday. I show up on time. You make a note of it. Then I make another appointment that I'm going to show up at Tuesday at 8 o'clock. What time are you going to expect me there? Because you begin to take me at my word. I have proven that I'm going to carry through with what I said was going to happen. And you begin to trust me more that I was going to do what I was going to say I was going to do. Does that make sense? The same thing is true about faith. Faith is taking God at his word. It is taking, we get faith by the word of God. That the Bible is full of promises. And that all you have to do is take a promise of God, just one, and apply it to your life. You do your part. God does his part. You say, God came through. That gives you more encouragement to take another promise. And trust God by faith. You do your part. God does his part. And you trust God at his word. Every time you do that, you are exercising faith. And every time God does his part, he keeps his word. You get more faith that God is going to do what he said he was going to do. Giving you more encouragement to take another promise and another one. So all you have to do to be pleasing to God right now is to take one promise from God's word and apply it to your life. And as you do your part, God does his part. You'll get more faith and you're pleasing to God because you took God at his word. Isn't that simple? And the more that I trust God, the more he'll do his part, the more faith I will have in him that he'll do his part again and do it again. Brand new Christians, they sometimes say, I don't know how this thing works. So preacher said I'm supposed to pray. He showed me a Bible verse that if you, uh, that if you ask, that God, you'll receive. And so I don't know how this works. So God, help me. And so are they pleasing to God then? Yes, because they've taken God as a word. Do they have a lot of faith at that time? No, but it's not how much faith you have. It's the object of your faith. But when God helps them and with whatever they're going through, they trust God at his word. Hey, this did work. And they try another one. And their faith increases. And their faith increases. And their faith increases with each promise they take. Does that make sense? So let's get a running start again and see where we're at. First of all, we said, why was we created? And what pleases God? And what is the definition of faith? Looking unto Jesus. And where do we get our faith? The word of God. Isn't that simple? That you can be pleasing to God today. In fact, you could be just as pleasing to God as I am as a pastor. Because it is not how much faith you have. It is the object of your faith. All you have to do is take God at his word. Trust him in his promise. And you are pleasing to God. Doesn't that make the Christian life achievable? Again, as I said before, I meet people all the time who are wondering and say, God, I don't know if I'm pleasing to you. I don't know if I'm doing anything right. I don't know. And they feel like God just condemns everything they do. But that's not how God wants people to live. God understands that we're at different stages. You just take the promise where you're at now and apply it. And you can be pleasing to God. In just a moment, I'll be preaching something for pulpit for a Sunday morning. God may give a promise there. You say, I'm going to take God at his word. And I may give so much that maybe you take a promise and you take a different promise, but you open up the Bible and say, that's for me. And you take God at his word and you're pleasing to God and you're pleasing to God. And you both walk out pleasing to God, Amen. but you may be at different stages of growth. And then God comes through for you. God comes through for you. You both trust God more so much that you want to take another promise. 
And both of you are still pleased. Isn't that simple? You can be pleasing to God. And God wants you to know that you can be pleasing to Him. Because we were created for what reason? And what pleases God? And where does, what is faith? And where do we get faith from? That's simple. And so as David has got right with God, he does say that I want to be pleasing to you. That you may be pleased. And David, even though he's recovering from some bad sin and from nine months of not being right with God, he can be pleasing because he's gotten right with God. He's trusted God at his word. And now he's ready to take another step of pleasing him. Trusting God at his word. Doesn't that take a burden off of us? Doesn't that lift it up? And doesn't it make it simple that you don't have to be a full-time Christian worker to please God? You could be pleasing God from where you're at now and just take one step and then another step and another step and another step and another step. Just taking God at his word, looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 Five three zero six three zero eight. Once again, that number is nine two zero five three zero six three zero eight. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.